Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a great day in Washington. Congress has gone home. <laughs> the government is still operating for another 60 days, so we have a lot to be pleased about. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, for being here. We have, I think, over 150 delegates from close to 40 cities. Uh, from throughout the world who are participating in this Global Cities Initiative, so we're just thrilled. I want to thank the Brookings Institution for their, for their leadership and their partnership. Uh, I want to acknowledge, I don't know if he's here yet, uh, the chairman of this initiative, uh, former Chicago Mayor Rich Daly, who has invested so much time and effort uh, into this program over the last uh, five years. I also want to acknowledge, I have a lot of J.P. Morgan Chase colleagues, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to uh, mention everybody, but there have been a number of people here who are here today. Phyllis Campbell from, the, from Seattle, who's the, uh, who's the vice chair of this initiative, and uh, Alexis Battalion, and Brian Finch, and Daniel Boren, and Caitlin McCarthy. So many people have been involved. We have market leaders, and one of our new J.P. Morgan Chase colleagues, General Ray Odierno, uh, who you'll hear from later this morning, who is now actually working on a project alongside with Brookings on how do we secure global cities? How do we address some of the, the new security challenges that so many cities uh, around the world face? So just thrilled and appreciative of all their um, efforts. It was great walking in here this morning to just to see so many people from different cities talking to each other, going over PowerPoint decks and understanding the data and what they're doing. Because five years ago when we, uh, what we saw was how the trends of globalization and urbanization were quickly shifting the economic landscape. And we launched this initiative with Brookings because of both the need and the opportunity to help cities better understand and better leverage their place in the global economy. And it has created this new approach to economic development, which we're very, very proud of. The data that Brookings uh, has developed is really helping cities better understand how they can, how they are, and how they can be better connected to the global economy and identifying opportunities to enhance their competitive uh, position. And what we particularly uh, are gratified to see is leaders from across the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector coming together, regions which are putting aside historical barriers, political barriers, geographic barriers, and really folk coming together to focus on a common purpose. We, you know, we've seen Chicago and their surrounding, seven surrounding counties come together around a uh, around an export uh, plan. Unprecedented collaboration, as you saw in the video, we've seen Lexington and Louisville come together, Seattle and Tacoma, we've seen Minneapolis and St. Paul, San Diego and Tijuana. When I hear people say, well, they're different states and different jurisdictions, okay, these are two cities in two different countries that have managed to come together and focus on how to grow the region. We have seen 28 regions over the last five years as part of this initiative, develop new trade and investment strategies. And what we know, what we have seen over the last five years, is that the regions that come together as regions and think of themselves as regions and act on these global opportunities, those are the places that are going to be the long-term winners in, in the global economy. We have made so much progress, but in so many ways, I think it's fair to say we've only scratched the surface. By the middle of the century, two-thirds of, of, of the world's population will live in and around cities and metropolitan regions. And while we've begun to develop responses to the social and the economic and the environmental challenges that come with that kind of growth, I think it would be a mistake to underestimate the challenges that lie ahead and how we connect the, the global positioning and the economic success of regions with the needs of people in those uh, regions, because at a time when so much economic development uh, activity is being channeled to commercial corridors and downtowns, and we see those areas continue to grow stronger and prosper, there are far too many neighborhoods uh, on the outskirts that are being left behind, that are facing higher rates of unemployment, higher rates of poverty. The demand for urban housing is driving up, is driving up costs and squeezing people out of downtown areas. Rents and home prices have soared 
in cities across the country, in places like Chicago, Detroit, Houston, rents went up even as, as, as wages, particularly for renters, have stagnated or have fallen. Nowhere is this evident more than, than here in this uh, region, the DC region, where over the last 30 years, housing costs have risen by 86%, while incomes for renters have risen only by 33%. That's a gap that's just not sustainable. And the people that are pushed out not only lack access to jobs and opportunity, they're often isolated in neighborhoods that are disconnected from good schools, disconnected from transportation, disconnected from safe and affordable housing, critical health, health programs, uh, and, and grocery stores. So what we know today, based on a lot of the work that we've done, is that neighborhood conditions, more so than income, are the key drivers of inequality. We hear a lot about inequality. It is not simply about income. It's about the conditions in the neighborhoods that too many, particularly too many young people, grow up in. A child growing up in an opportunity-rich environment is much more likely to progress than a child who, uh, from similar income, in a distressed neighborhood. And I think we can all agree that a child's future should not be predetermined by the economic health of the neighborhood that they live in. So as we all, as we all work to grow cities, to make them more global, to make them more prosperous, we have to connect this and make a collaborative effort to change these odds that so many people are facing. And frankly, the private sector, government can't do this alone, the nonprofit community can't do this alone. The private sector needs to play a much bigger role, not simply because it's the right thing to do as human beings, because, but because it, it is in our long-term interest. And if we can grow our communities, that's in the long-term interest of our companies. And this has become the central focus of J.P. Morgan Chase's corporate responsibility efforts and will be at the heart of our ongoing work around cities. Long-term commitments to expanding workforce readiness. Chauncey Lennon's here who leads that work. Growing small businesses, particularly those businesses which lack access to capital. Improving consumer financial health. All of this with the goal of driving more equitable growth for the people and the places who are left behind. Let me be clear about something, and I know this will be ironic as the guy representing a bank. This cannot just be about money. I understand how important money is to all of this, but the fact is we've seen a lot of money going into a lot of well-intentioned efforts that fail to strengthen underlying systems. So philanthropy alone will not solve this problem. And, and if we don't help the institutions that are there to develop, to, to deliver on the promise and on these services. So we've made the decision as a firm to deploy not just our resources, but the full range of our capabilities, our people, our expertise, our data, our proprietary data, and our relationships to create lasting impact. We're doing this through our Pro Neighborhoods Initiative, which many of your cities are involved in, which is helping communities overcome the biggest barriers to economic mobility through partnerships with community development financial institutions or CDFIs. We're focused on programs to grow small businesses, open retail centers, and build health and education facilities. We're working to build affordable housing and provide cities with more cutting edge data through our new J.P. Morgan Chase Institute, data that they can use. And I know many, many cities here have already gotten access to some of this data. And if you haven't yet, I encourage you to, to, to pursue this. This is data that will help, we believe, cities make much better informed decisions about economic development. What we are trying to do is go beyond traditional roles by bringing together best in class minds and resources which have been proven to work in the private sector. And I'll just mention, Detroit, frankly, as many of you know, we've done a lot of work, we see as a great example uh, of this kind of efforts. Detroit's revival under the leadership of a you know, phenomenal mayor, Mike Duggan, shows what can happen when leaders from across the, the community, the public, the private, the nonprofit sector, come together, collaborate, focus on solving problems, put their differences aside, and deploy the full range of their capability. So alongside our financial commitment in Detroit, 
We've, used, we've utilized our firm's data, our relationships, the expertise of some of our top managers we bring into Detroit from HR and technology and risk and bankers. I think we actually have a group that's there now or at least coming in the next, in the next few days to work with the city, to work with the mayor, and to particularly to work with the local nonprofits who have a lot of pressure on them to ensure that they are in the strongest position they can be to deliver on their uh, to their missions. And I would say the mayor uh, just recently reinforced the, the importance of this approach when he said that the time and the expertise that J.P. Morgan Chase has brought to the city has been just as valuable as the financial commitment. He did make clear he'll still take the money <laughs> in case there was any doubt, but that it, it won't work unless you actually can strengthen the institutions. And frankly, this has given us a model that we want to use for economic development in places around this country and around the world. We've learned a lot, and our plan is, and Irene Baker is here, who is now leading all of our uh, city's efforts for J.P. Morgan Chase, what we plan to do is actually take what we've learned through the Global Cities Initiative, through our work in, in Detroit, and take those lessons to other cities, to work with partners, to help develop much more integrated strategies for urban revitalization. Look, there's no silver bullet here. And I talk to mayors all the time who want to know, what, you know, what's the one thing I can do? Unfortunately, there's not one thing anyone can do. There are a lot of things that need to happen. It needs to be integrated. It needs to be coordinated. And, and it needs to actually reflect the broader assets and resources of the community. And that's why networks like this, frankly, are so important. And you know, as I said, I was thrilled to come today and just see people over the last two days really engaging. And you guys have been able to develop relationships on your own to learn from each other to learn about what works, and, and frankly, even more important, what doesn't work, so, so cities can avoid the mistakes that others have made. It's only that way that we're going to create both more equitable and more sustainable growth, because sustainable development is achieved only when the most vulnerable and underserved populations have genuine access to opportunity. So that's the goal that we are working towards, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do for the long-term interests of our communities and our companies. So let me just once again thank you all for your partnership, for your efforts and work over the last five years, and for the extraordinary things you're doing in your communities. It's, we've been very proud to be part of this effort. So thank you all for being here.